Great. Thank you, Janessa. For the people that just came in, please um, edit your name to be your name and your company name in case you missed that message. Um, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this delightful snow day. My name is Joy Shapiro, and I am home with my child and dog. So forgive me if there's interruptions of human or dog-like. Um, I am the immediate Boston past president, and on behalf of the board of directors, the committee chairs, and volunteers who are orchestrating today's program, I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you, have, if you are a regular at our Thought Leaders programming, welcome back. And if this is your first meeting, we are so pleased that you could join us today. These programs provide our FM members an opportunity to peer networking, information share, and find best practices. Before we get started, I wanted to share with you some upcoming events. Uh, we have a live program on March 21st and have another Thought Leaders program about to publish for the first week of April. That one will be a virtual and will focus on design trends for collaboration and amenities, again, in post-COVID world. Sorry. Ellie, could you get that dog outside? <laughs> so, dog, come. So before we get started, Again, I want to I want to thank Janatronics. I want to thank Janatronics and apologize profusely. Um, they underwrote today's program as part of their generous annual partnership. We are joined by Dorian Fergola and Rachel Lerner of Janatronics. I apologize again. I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit about Janatronics with you. Thank you, Dorian. Thanks so much, Joy. Good to see you. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to IFMA's Thought Leadership event on this first snow day of winter, which ironically is the last meteorological day of winter. Um, so go figure. <laughs> um, I am Dorian Fabola. I'm the Senior Vice President of Janatronics Building Services, um, doing business development and marketing. And Janatronics is a locally owned and managed commercial cleaning company celebrating over 45 years of business. And we're located in Waltham, Massachusetts. For those of you who may not know us, we're the third largest commercial cleaning company in the Boston area. We clean and maintain about 50 million square feet of Class A office, biotech, life science, and other facilities across the market. We're really happy this year to be a returning member of IFMA as my lights go off. So please ignore that. Um, and of course, I have lost my little conversation here. Something went crazy with my computer, Joy. How about that? Um, but anyway, Janatronic, oh, I see that my video is going crazy too. All right, so I'm not having a great introduction here, but what I can tell you is <laughs> that um, Janatronics is a, is a company that's been around for a long time. We do a lot of building services in the biotech and life science space. And I was really excited about today's presentation because um, you know we've all been through a COVID journey. There's no question about it. Um, you know, from our side, from our side of the fence, we so much had to pivot immediately being the first line of defense in a lot of ways for a lot of you guys um, on the FM side. And, you know, we had to, whether it was, you know, cutting back a little on the office side, growing our, our facilities management program for folks on the life science side who are still continuing to, um, you know, really tackle the disease, whatever. Uh, you know, there were a lot of things that we had to do with our client partners to go through this journey together. And, I'm really curious to see what uh, you guys are feeling now that we're sort of getting to this new stage of the game, um, kind of post COVID, although we did just clean our, close our offices for two weeks because we had a small outbreak here. So um, so we like to think that it's gone. It's not necessarily gone, um, but I am looking forward to hearing the story. So thank you so much for giving me this time and I look forward to talking to you. And if anybody needs anything from us anytime, give me a call. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dorian. Um, we're all having technical difficulties. If only we had an FM on the phone to help <laughs> us through the dog situations and the working from home situations, perhaps we could get their advice. <laughs> we're gonna kick off this program with three amazing thought leaders who we have brought together to share this journey and stories from COVID and beyond. We welcome 
all three CFMs, Maria Vickers, Michelle Schuler, and John LaRusso. I will now turn it over to Maria to get the program started. Take it away, Maria. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, uh, Janessa, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so my name is Maria Vickers. I am the uh, Facility Services Associate Director for WTW New England offices. WTW um, is a uh, risk management um, company. We provide data-driven insight-led solutions in the areas of people, risk, and capital. We handle things like um, risk management and analytics, investments and capital management, cyber risk, reputational risk, insurance consulting and broking, um, and we have various products related to uh, human resources management, um, whether they're working or retired. And so that's just a snapshot of WTW. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so before COVID, um, we had started a journey um, that got rudely interrupted as all our journeys did. Um, before COVID, WTW had an in-office expectation. And if you wanted to work remote, you had to sign an agreement with your manager and HR, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were transitioning to agile. Um, we were getting rid of assigned seats. It was a little bit like pulling teeth. There was a lot of policing of the clear desk policy, um, but we were we started that journey. We were um, revising our sites to be 75% seats versus heads, um, and we were putting in more call and huddle rooms. We had lines of business assigned to neighborhoods so that uh, the, they could sit together. Um, we had lockers for people to put their stuff in overnight and assigned file drawers. We were also a little behind the times transitioning from PBX phone systems to Microsoft Skype telephony. We had limited AV in our conference rooms. Our large conference rooms had video conferencing equipment, but our small and medium sized conference rooms only had audio conferencing uh, in those rooms. And then of course, our occupational health and safety program was limited to the office. Next slide, please. Post COVID, this is um, where we are now. It's it's actually there was COVID was a little bit of a silver lining, if I'm allowed to say that. We now have flexible work styles. Um, and, uh, colleagues can choose their work style in collaboration with their manager as either office hybrid or remote. There's no longer a signed agreement required for remotes. There's a few positions that are office based and those are specifically called out. Uh, facility services is one of them. Um, so that has been a real boon for our colleagues and uh, COVID helped us to push that through. We are streamlining what uh, agile environment needs means to us. We're having a further reduction of our seats versus heads. We're adopting co-working in some locations where it works. Um, we're putting more collaboration spaces into our uh, offices. We have enhanced call rooms, which I'm using now, which has a super large screen and an integrated camera. Um, we no longer are providing lockers for overnight storage. Um, we are no longer keeping files on site. The electronic record is now the official record and COVID helped us to get to that point. And we are in the process of increasing our network and Wi-Fi capacity in all our offices because the original Wi-Fi and network weren't necessarily built for hybrid meetings such as we are having a lot of now. So we're, we're getting upgrades to our network. Um, we transitioned very quickly uh, during the COVID period from uh, the Skype that we were using to MS Teams telephony, and we are also in process of um, bringing in more Teams capabilities for our colleagues. We are upgrading our audio visual with Teams integration in all our meeting spaces so that even the small and medium size conference rooms now have a video conferencing capability with Teams. Um, and we have extended our OHS program um, to provide health and safety resources for our colleagues is for both home and office. 
Um, so that was a little bit of our uh, during COVID journey. Uh, next, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, what now moving forward, we have some particular challenges in the facility services department because of the COVID uh, changes. Schedule sharing is a big challenge. Our colleagues want to know who will be in the office on what days, but they don't want to register. So um, it's it's very difficult to, to, to provide them with this information. They keep asking us if we can provide badge swipe information, which of course we're not going to do. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge to get people to actually talk to each other, to, to tell each other when they're going to be in the office. Um, we have a little bit of an identif identity crisis in the facilities management department. Are we facilities maintenance or we're working more, we're moving more towards workplace services instead of maintenance. So there's a bit of an identity crisis that we're dealing with and we're trying to figure out. Of course, we have fewer and smaller offices and of course, smaller facility management teams. So we've had to realign a lot of work um, as to who do, does what. Um, we're still in that process. And we're also having to change lanes a lot and fill in the gap where IT used to fill. Um, IT is no longer on site. That was a COVID implemented change. And so people are coming to facilities to help them with their IT. Um, so we're trying to fill that gap. We're also becoming the on-site AV uh, subject matter experts. We used to rely on IT to do that, um, but they're no longer here and we're using it more and more in this hybrid environment. So we are becoming facility services is, is uh, embracing that challenge. And then finally, real estate is making decisions about um, uh, office, the future of offices kind of in a bubble. Um, they're, um, you know, they're, they're aggressively downsizing and changing the designs of the offices and, and facility services is struggling to get a seat at that table. On the flip side, we've had a big win with the AV um, because we have embraced the AV challenge. Now that there are increased hybrid meetings, um, the facilities team has become a critical part of each colleague's in-office experience. It gives us lots of positive visibility. It has allowed my team to grow because we've had to learn how to use the AV systems, which is, was all new to us. Um, so that has been a real win for us. Um, so that's my WTW uh, pre and post. COVID journey and our moving forward challenges and wins. And I'm gonna pass this on now to Michelle. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Michelle Schuler. I'm the Director of Workplace Services supporting the Americas for UKG. Um, I'm gonna go through a little bit today about our journey to becoming UKG. Um, so it'll become clearer in the next slide or two. Um, but UKG um, is an HR um, so workforce management solution. Um, so we do timekeeping, payroll, um, uh, all sorts of you know, kind of back end. You know, we're using it for performance reviews, and it's a whole um, suite that we're launching out to our employees utilizing um, our two legacy companies, which I'll, I'll talk about next. So before COVID, uh, we were two. Um, so UKG didn't exist um, before March of 2020. Um, we were Kronos Incorporated, which is headquartered here in Lowell, Massachusetts, and Ultimate Software, which is headquartered down in Western Florida. Um, we announced this merger um, February 24th, I believe it is, of 2020, and then we closed our offices three weeks later. Um, so it's been a wild journey. Um, Pre-COVID, um, on the Chrono side, we had 23 locations globally. It was about a million square feet and 6,000 Chronites. About 40% of our population was already remote, um, and 60% were office-based with a one-to-one -one seating model. Um, we had some pretty strict, what we called we and me space policies, uh, where directors and above could have a private office. Um, everybody else was in, in cubicles. Um, I joke that it's like 1970s out there with, with true like old school cubicles. 
Um, we had just moved to Teams um, from Skype, which was not a good solution for us. Um, and we have a full Microsoft suite. Um, systems and tools, like I said, we were on Skype, it was a little antiquated. Um, it was the mentality of this is always how we did it. Um, so, you know, coming in and starting to try to make changes was, was a little tricky. Um, and that's, you know, local lack of, you know, global alignment and then change in innovation weren't, you know, were not typical, you know, each function operated differently and made their own decisions. Um, it was, it worked, but it didn't work as the company was growing. Um, so we are starting to make some of those kind of changes where we're making more functional, um, across function um, decisions. There was a strong culture of care for employees. So great benefits programs, unlimited vacation time, um, a ton of holidays. Um, I joke that the sidewalks rolled up around here at five o'clock. Uh, everybody, you know, would pretty much be, you know, sent home to have that work-life balance, which was great, except for some of us. Um, and there was a long tenure. So the average tenure was 12 years, but there's been so many that have 20, 30 years of tenure. Some have been here since the beginning, which has been 45 years. Um, it's, they're all starting to retire at this point, but it's, it's long tenured. And we were also pretty tight with the wallet. Uh, so we had a smart spending policy where travel when you needed to. It wasn't just to travel, just to travel. Don't go and buy all the swag. Don't keep buying all this new software. Like where can we um, you know, save so that bonuses can also be more robust and we can offer all of these great amenities. On the ultimate side, um, they had 18 locations, mostly based in the US and Canada. They had about 500,000 square feet and 6,000 LT peeps. So on paper, our companies were like for like. That's where you break it down a little bit. It got a little dicey, um, which made this merger so much fun. Um, they had about 50% remote um, employees already. Um, the Google Suite solution. So we had to integrate our solutions. Um, they had a very strong public facing culture. Um, so up here in the Boston area, I had never heard of Ultimate Software before. I don't know if anybody up here has. Um, but if you go to, to down to Western Florida, Miami, Ultimate was plastered everywhere. They were also on the Miami Heat uniforms. Um, it is now UKG for, this is the last season. Um, so everything was public facing, um, you know, kind of that shiny, shiny persona, but on the inside, things were starting to crumble a bit. Um, Everybody got a private office that wanted one. So it's literally just floors and floors of private offices. Um, and then every regional office ran as its own small business. So there was no consistent experience. Um, so it was really trying to now merge this together got, got you know very complicated as well. And amenity programs were ex um, very extensive. Um, and what I say is not sustainable is things that you can't do as you grow. Um, so, you know, again, trying to, to rein that in has been, been an interesting battle. And they spent money, um, again, to make things easy or showy and not so much on the right side. So as you can see on the top, it looks pretty good. And on the bottom, it gets a little, a little interesting. So then post-COVID, uh, we are UKG. Um, this has been dubbed a merger like no other. Um, so now we are 17,000 new crewers. Um, globally, we have 52 uh, locations, 1.8 million square feet. Um, we're dual headquartered. So we have Lowell and Western Florida. Um, and you know we tried to merge this company during COVID. So everybody was sitting at home. I don't know if that gave us a, a good leverage point if everybody was on equal playing ground or if it was a hindrance, we haven't figured that out yet, um, but it was definitely a challenge. Um, what it did was it gave us the opportunity though to come together pretty quickly and make the COVID operating team. Um, we had to you know, create some integrations so that everybody could have access to the same platforms. Um, and then, you know, obviously doing the rebranding globally to UKG has been an ongoing, ongoing battle. Uh, there is wallpaper everywhere. Um, so we're working through that. But post COVID, some of our team updates, um, our teams have been fully um, integrated. Um, and so specific to the workplace services team, um, both teams have been integrated. We've done a complete realignment. Um, so whereas I took on um, the operations for the facilities operations for um, Canada, US and South America, 
um, and then that got, the other pieces got realigned to other, other groups. Um, the complete rebrand of workplace services. So we were corporate services on the Chrono side. Um, on the UK, on the ultimate side, they were facilities. Um, it just wasn't um, cohesive. So I worked to get that rebranded pretty early on. That was done kind of mid 2020. Um, so we are workplace services. Um, and I'll show you kind of in the next slide what, what that looks like and what's under that umbrella. You know, where, you know, our goal and our mission is to work as a partner for all the function leaders. Um, you know, sometimes you, you hear that, oh, facilities will take care of it. That's that's not our mission. That's not what we do. We partner um, in some of these projects that I'll talk about in a second. Um, we'll, you know, show you that we work to partner with all of these function leaders. Um, and then educating our team on the growth mindset, thinking like a global team and strategic goals. That has been um, an ongoing battle because, as I mentioned, every small um, office got to operate as its own small business. Um, so if you're a 50 person company versus a 6000 person company, it feels very different. Um, so just really working through what that looks like and, and you know, helping people kind of grow and develop there. State of work. Um, so this is, you know, the big, the big hot topic. Um, so we've got hybrid office and hybrid remote. Um, and attendance is based on a functional directive. So our functions are our engineering teams, IT, finance, legal, um, HR. So each function leader um, has its own requirements. Um, our engineering team and IT teams just mandated um, three days a week. So there's no exception unless you're on vacation. Um, you will be in the office three days a week. Um, it's exciting for us because we get people back in the office, um, but it's also creating a lot of turmoil and anxiety amongst the employees. So we're trying to make this as seamless as possible. Uh, our global space policy. So again, to you know, go along with the state of work, you know, everybody um, will be functioning in, in a reservable desk program, unless you're in the office three days a week, then you get a one-to-one -one desk assignment. Um, we utilize a software called iOffice. Um, so we um, implemented that last year. So we're using iOffice as kind of the full suite. Um, it's been great. It has a few, a few little, you know, glitches, but it's better than the ServiceNow program we were using before. So getting people accustomed to that and making sure that they're using the reservable desk model. Um, we are fully integrated in our MS suite uh, globally. And like I mentioned, we use um, iOffice for all of our space management ticket, ticketing system and asset management um, tools. We also have a global duty of care program. So it's employee hotlines, travel assistance and emergency management. And you know, those are some of the, the things that we're trying to figure out what is the future of that. So the employee hotlines were, we had a COVID hotline that we managed, um, but we also have just an emergency hotline. Are you traveling and you know, your car broke down on the side of the road? Um, are you traveling and you're in danger? Are you traveling you know, overseas? Um, the travel assistance, again, you know, car broke down. And then emergency management is basic you know, building evacuations. How do you run that now? You can't really have evacuation teams anymore because nobody's in the office. Um, so we're kind of putting the onus a little bit back on the employees of training everybody and, you know, trying to have, you know, key people, but it's it's tricky if they're only in three days a week because you know that one day somebody's not in is when it's going to happen. And then um, real estate, global alignment of our portfolio. So we had a lot of locations during the merger that shockingly, Alpharetta, Georgia, we had an ultimate office and a Kronos office. So we were merging those as leases come up. In Weston, Florida, our campus is uh, 14 buildings spread across the town. It's not really a campus. So we're working to bring that more into a campus model too. So there's a lot of work going on, on the real estate side. And this is our future. Um, so global workplace services. Um, so we've uh, it says out, it's our mission. Um, but our mission is we strive to elevate and care for our people by creating partnerships to provide an exceptional, inspiring, and inclusive workspace. So that is our new mission statement. We've launched that out along with this little um, icon here. So this is the umbrella. Um, so Global Workplace Services is our operations and office services, workplace project and programs, workplace security, 
uh, AV services, construction, real estate, duty of care and emergency management and event services. Um, so we have a pretty large team globally. We're about a hundred people. It's actually fairly small in the grand scheme of things where we're pretty lean, but you know, hundred people is a decent amount. Um, and we're working, you know, every day to try to make this experience, whether you're remote or um, in the office, a great one, making sure that everybody is cared for um, properly. Um, you know, some of our challenges that we're, we're seeing here are, you know, how do you move past COVID? Um, because COVID was such an important piece of what we did, you know, how do we move past that? How do we drive people back to the office? Um, you know, how do we continue to make hard decisions um, to, for what's best for UKG and not the legacy companies? And how do we stay agile enough to support the state of work without compromising productivity? Um, and then how do we stay best in class for benefits of programs, but also making them still relevant as we grow? Uh, so we have these you choose programs where if you have different um, fitness clubs or a member of, you can expense up to a certain amount. Um, if you want to expense your running shoes because you're a runner, I know Janessa loves running shoes. Um, you know, so there's all these programs that you can, you know, take part of to make sure that the, um, the benefits and everybody's um, engaged. And then some of our win, or our, our biggest win is, you know, we're seen as a value add partner um, across all the functions. You know, all the programs that we've rolled out, we've, we've partnered with the function leaders. Um, and we don't want to be that, you know, the, the, the people that just execute, we want to be, we want that seat at the table and we have worked really hard to get that seat. Um, you know, we've had the COVID response, integration activities, RTEO, reservable seating, and on top of COVID and this merger, we have done five acquisitions at the same time, um, including great place to work. Um, so we've been integrating them into our practices too. So it's been, it's been a wild ride. I'll pass it over to John. Start over, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Michelle. My name is John LaRusso. I'm the Vice President of Facility Management at Ajiro. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So Ajiro is probably a company that none of you have heard about, but you, you may have interacted with us uh, along the way. Uh, Ajiro helps over 30,000 drivers every day uh, through a unique combination of intelligent and human power. As a pioneer of the driver assistant industry, our mission is to create stronger and lasting relationships between our clients and their customers. Ajira was founded in 1972 when our chairman and founder, Sidney Walk, uh, took our first roadside assistance call from his home. So we, we are white label. Uh, we cover probably two thirds of the automotive OEM. So if you have a warranty with your car, there's a good chance that you have uh, roadside assistance included with that during that, say it's a three year 36,000 mile uh, warranty. So there's a, there's a good chance that if you have a flat, uh, need your uh, lock, uh, need a lock popped or a, a jump start, you might be calling into one of our call centers and, and, and we're entering the phone as uh, either an insurance carrier or uh, 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 an automotive OEM. Next slide, please. So where were we pre-COVID? Uh, 2019 was a very active year for Ajiro. Uh, we had 2,400 associates in, spread out in five contact centers, as well as our corporate headquarters based in Medford and an office out in San Francisco, total in 400,000 square feet. We were fully in person. Uh, at the same time, we had the flexibility to work remote. Uh, there, there, were, there were no requirements for that other than understanding from, uh, from supervisor, but anyone that wasn't in a meeting room really had a hard time following, or, uh, following along. So in order to, to, to be in on the action, you really needed to be in the office. Uh, we continued uh, to during that time to partner with contact center outsourcers and automate and, and the automation uh, dispatch process, uh, which you know we all, it, it, which which includes um, you know handheld devices, uh, mobile you know being able to dispatch from a mobile phone, uh, as well as um, 
IVR technology. In 2020, we originally planned to pilot 100 work from home agents. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. In the fall of 2019, we, re re we relocated our corporate headquarters in Medford, as well as our San Francisco office. Uh, again, we were gonna be all in person and assigned seating. Uh, one of our outsourced partners actually ended up taking over our Sebring, Florida location in the fall of, of 2020. And we were able to, where, where they we were able to negotiate a lease termination and they picked up uh, and, and ultimately signed a lease with, with the landlord. So it was, it was a clean handoff. Uh, we also announced that we would be closing our Ontario call center in the spring of 2020. Uh, at the time, the majority of our business was using Microsoft Office while uh, the San Francisco office was on a Google suite, you know, similar scenario to, to UKG. Uh, we were using a combination of Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Slack. And um, they, all, all those technologies were starting to, to uh, gain traction within the business. Next slide, please. So fast forward to uh, March of 2020. Uh, we became fully high, uh, really fully remote at the time. We ended up moving 2,000 call center agents to work from home, and we did it over a two-week period in March, and, and that, in, in March of 2020. Similar scenario to, to, to most of us uh, that, that you know, we all dealt with uh, at the time. Uh, but it went off without a hitch. The technology upgrades that we that we completed as, as part of some of the office moves in 2019 uh, had us ready to go, and, and uh, we haven't looked back since. In 2022, we rolled out our hybrid work model, although we are what I would consider fully remote. Uh, we're at, in our corporate headquarters, we're averaging roughly 25 a day, and in uh, in our call center in Clarksville, Tennessee, we're averaging roughly 35, 40 a day. Uh, Pre-pandemic, that was that number was 700 at, at, uh, in, in Clarksville, and people were waiting for seats. Uh, in early 2022, we announced that Tri Cities and uh, our, our Tri Cities and Tucson contact centers were both going fully remote, uh, and. There, there really wasn't a desire for, for any of the agents to come back and it, and it was working. Uh, we, had, we had roughly uh, 10 months left on our lease in Tri-Cities and through, uh, through our network, uh, comes to, uh, we learned that a local uh, company approached us that needed call center space immediately. We were able to execute and exit that space, terminate that lease in two months and, and and basically hand over the keys to them. Uh, obviously, significant savings uh, that was unexpected. We were fully planning on carrying that property to, to end of term. Uh, we also uh, subleased the space in San Francisco, and we've begun call consolidating in Medford. Uh, and then we're currently listing uh, properties in Clarksville, Medford, Ontario, and Tucson uh, for uh, uh, for sublease. Uh, and my team is currently working with uh, the, the technology and HR teams to ultimately settle on hybrid seating for our corporate office. Uh, we're looking at neighborhoods, unassigned and assigned seating. It's, it's everybody really does want their cake and they want to eat it too. It's not as simple as, hey, we're going to go, we're, we're going to hotel or, uh, you know, uh, determining X number of days qualifies for assigned seating because the goal is to shrink the footprint as much as possible and hopefully get down to, the intent is to get to one floor. Uh, as from a technology standpoint, uh, we've moved uh, every the, the enterprise over to, to Google Workplace Suite. Uh, we're, we're all on Slack and Zoom and, and as, uh, Maria pointed out, AV is an ongoing challenge that that we're that we're all wrestling with. Next slide, please. Uh, 
hybrid and remote isn't going away, but our question is, will we see a return to office at some point and how do we, you know, how do we plan for that? In the meantime, we're, we're, we're focusing on the in-office experience and, and how we can make this uh, a place of, that, uh, that our associates want to come in and, and, and meet with their colleagues. Uh, and have that face-to-face -face interaction that that some of them uh, have expressed an, an interest in. Um, obviously, our organizations are shrinking too. You know, my team is, it, it has fifty percent less people uh, than we did pre-pandemic, and we're we're all doing less with more. We're managing remote facilities. That's a new experience, uh, and um, it, it's. It's a challenge, and we're figuring it out. And it, and and so far, so good. Uh, as as far as uh, the unpredictability, even though we have strong vendor partnerships, and which is critical to our success, that doesn't always solve the supply chain issues. So they're there for us, but what used to take a day or a week can now take two or three months. So we're trying to set realistic expectations as far as service level with our customers. Uh, and then I, I, uh, both Michelle and Maria highlighted on, uh, on it as well. You know, we're still referred to as facilities within a Jiro, but we've definitely reinvented ourselves to support, you know, both the hybrid, remote, and in-person workplace. Uh, and then for us, the, the big wins uh, in, in, in 2022, it, it's, it's real estate transactions, being able to get out of some of these leases. We've got some strong uh, prospects in the pipeline to take over additional space and, and have proposals out. And, and uh, that's something that, that we're looking forward to. So, um, so I'll hand it over to Janessa. Excellent. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, for your input for this. So Janessa is going to break us out into breakout sessions. Um, and the three questions there that you see on your screen right now um, are what we would like you to discuss. So clearly COVID had a, a bit of a silver lining in that it helped to push us all to the next level of hybrid working. Um, it's brought us some wins along the way. Uh, but it has brought us new challenges that we have not had to face before and we're struggling to figure out. So what are your post-COVID challenges? What are your post-COVID successes? How are you defining yourselves now? Um, the breakout session, you may not have time to answer all questions, but if you can get to one or two, that would be great. And then um, Sherry, we'll, we'll share your findings uh, when we get back to the meeting. Janessa? Excellent. I'm going to put you into um, a series of rooms. All you have to do is say yes. I think in the um, observance of time, we'll probably do around seven to eight minutes. I made the rooms a little bit smaller, so you'll all be able to feel free to introduce yourselves and what, how you're coming to the table. And then we'll, I'll bring you back out. I'll give you like a one minute warning um, or a two minute warning. Thank you. Welcome back. All right, Maria. I think everyone- Are we all back? I think everyone is back. You take it away. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, in my little group, we, um, we had some common uh, challenges, um, specifically around uh, downsizing and space constraints now that they've downsized. Um, and um, there's also the issue with leaders staying at home. 
um, and everybody wants an assigned seat. But on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of focus on defining community spaces, innovation space, focus spaces, and ways of working that COVID has brought to the fore. And, and that's a, a pretty good thing, I think. So um, if uh, I'll call on, so I was in group five, um, and I'll call on uh, the other group numbers if somebody just wants to talk about um, the challenges that they're facing or the answers to the questions that they come up with. Um, group one. That was John and I, and it was hey. a delightful conversation. Um, <laughs> I'll give him a break because he spoke today. Uh, we had talked just about um, working from home and mandated policies and what the return to offices and the difficulties of where you're geographically located as opposed to what your work from home policy is. I know that most of the people in my headquarters live like five minutes from the office, which is great. So we, we're all in there every day um, and we mostly did it through COVID. But I would say, and John agreed, that if you're working from home, you're normally not shutting down at five o'clock and just walking away from your desk. We're at our computers, like you go back at six before dinner or seven o'clock. So I think the productivity that we've seen from our staff to do the same thing. And then talking a little bit about leadership and the age of leadership and the mentality of if I don't see you in the office, you're not doing anything. So we want you back here. And my three owners are over the age of 55, some like past retirement age, whatever that is at this time. And they believe that you're just sitting in your house watching TV, which I will do after this, but right now I'm working. <laughs> So that was our conversation. Thank you. And I just remember this is recorded. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Breakout group number two. Anyone want to speak we, from that team? We, we didn't set a leader, but I'll, but I'll go for it. I mean, I, people were talking about uh, um, having a lot of the similar issues. Um, uh, as, as everyone else, as the speakers that had come forward. Um, and it's really a personal thing, whether or not you want to work in the office or work mm -hmm. at home. Right. Um, I did bring up that our group converted from FM to workplace during the year. And we used, um, if must slash we's training program, which was delivered virtually, except for the very last session, which we did in London, um, workplace strategy, leadership, program and I'll put the link into the chat. It was really, really good for us, especially because we reorganized our entire department at the same time. We're half the size we were like many, but so too is our portfolio. So, um, and any of the others, if you have anything else to add, please do. I think the other, uh, the other topic was just this, the way to standardize communicating to your colleagues and team that you're in office. I had found in our place that that was an open uh, question that keeps recurring. When are you in the office mm -hmm. and, and the transparency around that? And so my solution was just put it on my calendar and then you can see it and other, you know, but it depends on your comfort and making that level of transparency there or just putting it on there to kind of communicate that to others so they see it, but that's definitely um, an open issue. So it's a matter of, is it technology? Is it just habits? Is it your own business unit or department's personal choice and how you choose to communicate that level of when you're in or when you're not in? Right. In, in, in my company, we've uh, just started to see a lot of the leaders are designating one day a month for their entire uh, teams to come in and, and have that one day a month. And that's been working mm -hmm. pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We had that as well. Like at least, um, I think formally it was like one day a week and have like a central day. People try to rally around coming in. So you expect to see folks in right. on a Wednesday. Uh, we found right. midweek time is like the prime time Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, when most folks are coming into the office in those three days. Thank you. How about team number three? Matthew, you want to lead that one? I wasn't sure what team we were. <laughs> All right, I guess we're three. 
Um, we talked a lot about hybrid, you know, being a good thing in a lot in, in a lot of ways. But uh, we just talked a lot about different. For me, it was different clients, different spaces. How some some folks were were way advanced as far as how to facilitate a hybrid meeting. You got some people in the office, which is great. They come into the office. Some people staying at home. Um, some companies get it. They were, they're really fast to adapt. And uh, you know, with, with just the refurbishment of the, the, the conference rooms, whether it be a small huddle room or a large conference room, the flat screen, the AV capabilities, I should say. Um, I've been with some clients in some rooms and you know they figured out a long time ago. It's a really enjoyable experience when you got a couple of folks on the screen uh, talking uh, on the phone. It's, 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 it was really good. But I've also been on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, with some other clients where they, they you can tell they're they're struggling. Um, there, there still is no flat screen, um, so everyone has to open up their laptops, try to get on Teams or Zoom to see people, and then they try to consolidate on the speakerphone on the conference table, and that doesn't work, you know. So, you know, they could tell they didn't spend any time or invest anything into it. So, it, it's all over the board right now, is what we would discuss as far as a, a hybrid meeting, because it, it's in, and we also talked a little about the theme of uh, it's a moving target. How do we facilitate? as workplace services, you know, do we need to jump into the AV world? Sounds like, it sounds like a lot of us have. Um, and just how do we help them at home? How do we help them when they're office? When are they gonna be in the office? You know, we talked about remote desking and all that. So it, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel settled yet. It's a moving target and that kind of right. res resonated with us. Thank you. So in the interest of time, um, we've, we've run a little short. Um, are there any other teams that came up with something that hasn't already been noted as either a challenge or a win. And feel free to keep the conversation going uh, in chat at once the meeting closes. Yes. Hey, Maria, Joanne Trask, Mass General Brigham. Just real quick, when in my room, I brought up two things that, that I thought were one is for managers, it was this has all been an opportunity and a challenge for them to realize they don't need their teams right outside their cube or their door. So, you know, even just getting pe managers has been a challenge, right? So just acknowledging that prior to COVID, every, every manager thought their people had to be in, they wouldn't be productive if they couldn't see them, blah, blah, blah. So there was that. And the second thing for us over at Mass General Brigham, believe it or not, may sound little, is we took away coffee when the building went empty and we thought <laughs> the building went empty. But now, even though we only have 400 people coming in on an average instead of 4,000, we haven't brought coffee back yet. And Yikes. it's a topic on everybody's tongue and senior leaders aren't. We brought in filtered water. We brought in filtered hot water. We brought in ice machines, but yeah, we don't have coffee. So that's big. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joanne. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Maria, Michelle, yeah. and John. Thank you, team, so much. Janessa, over to you. You're on mute. Okay, my friends. Before you leave, and I'm going to do this really, really quick. This conversation, we want it to continue in our next white paper, which is this evolution of where the FM role is going. We've already talked about this from facilities to workplace. Is it from um, services to experience and so forth? And so our next white paper, we want to interview three to 900, it doesn't make a difference. I won't turn anyone down, of FMs who are starting to see their role change to accommodate this like stewards of work-life balance. Like how are we helping, like John, you were saying like, you're fully remote. How are you now supporting all of those people? Used to be like, oh, well, if you're working from home, you're on your own. But now what are the programs that your company has? Do you have new leadership roles that are just looking at this experience for people outside and so forth? So IFMA at ifmaboston.org, right after this, if you or someone within your company would like to contribute to the white paper. All it is is a 20 minute phone call with our copy writer and she'll just ask you lots of questions. She will watch this as well to get ideas on kind of where we're seeing things are going. Um, and, you know, for anyone who's already been on the call that submitted, you know, has helped in the past, easy peasy. You will see also the backgrounds of anyone who's on Think Tank. These are the folks on this call who are in leadership 
to come up with the topics for these programs. We're always looking for volunteers. It's not a heavy lift and it's helping kind of make sure that all of our programming is aligned with our facility managers. And lastly, May 10th, put it on your calendar, FM forward. It will be from nine to two. So you can still have a little TV time or meeting time or whatever we're going to. It's no less than what we've had in the past. We're just doing it in a very condensed time to keep everyone's attention. It will also include our 20th annual awards of excellence. Two minutes over, not too bad. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to all of our speakers. And this will be recorded and uploaded. So if you want to um, share it with anyone, please do. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great program. Well done. Bye-bye.